Thank you so much. Um, and since this is kind of a packed house, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure whether we would be able to have kind of a setup with tables and, you know, lots and lots of arm space for people to, to do their computering um, efficiently and like the sport that it is. Uh, so if you just want to watch me as the um, run through the demos, that's fine. Um, there will be links for you to follow so that you can uh, sort of explore all of the Jupyter notebooks. Um, and I'll be running them all in Google Colab. So how many folks here have used Google Colab before? Oh, man. Okay. So, so I know that uh, I, this, is, this is being recorded. I was just informed. Um, not, uh, not as many hands as I was expecting came up in the audience, which is great. I'm giving you a present today, so this is, this is fun. Um, Google Colab, uh, you'll see in a minute, but it's a Jupyter Notebook-like environment that is completely run in the browser, um, and it gives you the ability to use CPUs, um, but also GPUs and TPUs uh, for free. So all you have to do is, is just kind of open up a notebook environment using Colab, and you're off to the races with TPUs. And if you're not familiar with what TPUs happen to be, they're specialized hardware for deep learning, um, the same sort of hardware that we use at Google. Uh, cool. Awesome. So with that, uh, let's get started. So I'm Paige Bailey. I'm a developer advocate for TensorFlow at Google. I've been working at Google since November of last year. Um, and before that, for about a year and a half, I was at Microsoft. Um, I wound up in the office of the Azure CTO doing software engineering. Um, and before that, I was doing a combination of data science and sort of geophysical work and uh, software applications at Chevron for about five years. Um, and before that, it was NASA projects. Uh, but they were, they were all data science-y, uh, kind of before they called data science, data science. Uh, so, so I've been doing this for a while, is the point. And I love Python. Um, most of the examples that you see today will be in Python. Um, how many of folks in the audience are familiar with that language in particular? Many more hands this time. Fantastic. And I sense that I know this is kind of a Spark-affiliated audience. Um, how many of you guys are more Scala types? Java? A few hands, maybe? Cool. So we do, have, um, we do have Java bindings for TensorFlow, but um, they, I don't believe there is quite as build out as the Python ones. Um, so as I mentioned, it'll be a, a pretty Python heavy lecture today. And the plan more or less um, is to give a machine learning 101 to, to sort of discuss why it would be useful, um, to talk about what is TensorFlow 2.0 in particular and why we're very excited about it and also to talk about how you can get started with TensorFlow 2.0 immediately, um, at least with the alpha. And to begin with, I guess, um, we could start talking about what is AI. Um, and AI is really any technique that enables computers to mimic human behavior. And if you go by that definition, AI has been around for a long time, right? Since the 50s and 60s when Marvin Minsky was all about robots and thinking that he would have to explicitly program every if-else statement in order to have an intelligent agent accomplish a task. So um, the idea that you would just give some sort of input into a computer and it would give you back a response that would be similar to a response that you would expect from a human. So this isn't too much of a complex idea. Um, this, is, this is just kind of the typical programming model that you would think of as a computer scientist. The same thing that people have been doing for years and decades. Um, machine learning is where it gets a little bit more interesting. And this is when I first got excited about computer science. Um, it's the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So instead of you as a developer being responsible for explicitly defining all of the logic, um, you can have a machine do it for you. And if you're lazy, like me, uh, this, is, this is sort of delightful. And what does this look like, right? So, so historically, um, you would have a series of things like if-else statements. You would have to have um, sort of heuristically defined, um, heuristically defined rules, um, and you would also have some input data. So you would have this logic, you would have the data, and you would get back some sort of output as response. With machine learning, um, you have what your expected output should be, um, you have your input data, and you get back those rules and confidence levels. 
So instead of, of you having to define that last bit, um, it's sort of taken care of for you by whatever algorithm you select. And the input data and the output labels could be a variety of things. So it could be, I have all of this data about a human and I expect um, you know, that that human is a Republican. Or it could be, um, here's a JPEG and I expect, uh, I expect this to say cat, like because there's a picture of a cat inside of it. Um, so it could be a variety of things. And uh, this is just another way to look at it, um, taken from Francois Chalet, the author of Karis's book. You have input rules and data, and you get back answers with traditional programming. And with machine learning, you have answers and data, and then you get back those rules. Um, and again, if you're lazy, this is a much better sort of experience. Um, this is a terrible image, uh, like a terrible sort of decision-based tree. Uh, one of my professors in college said that that's, uh, that's how you know that you've been in a discipline too long is when you start criticizing the figures in textbooks because they're not, uh, they're not the, the level of complexity that you desire. Um, but this is also a pretty decent high level overview of traditional machine learning. So you usually have two branches, either supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Unsupervised are things like clustering, um, where you don't necessarily know the answers before you go into the problem, right? So with clustering, you're just trying to find relationships between data um, that then you can use to make some sort, of, um, some sort of decision. With supervised learning, you know what you're looking for. So you know that if you see, um, based on your historic data, these specific characteristics, um, probably a Republican, probably a Democrat, or um, probably you know, a cat or a dog. Um, and supervised learning has two real categories, so um, classification and regression. In classification, you're trying to predict a category. So again, Republican, Democrat, red, blue, et cetera. Um, and with regression, you're attempting to predict a numeric value. So I'm going to sell seven widgets in July of next year. And there are a variety of algorithms that you can select to solve each of these tasks. None works for every scenario, though uh, gradient boosted trees and random forests seem to be pretty popular, uh, at least on Kaggle. Um, but uh, you can see some examples there of things like support vector machines, k-nearest neighbors, um, linear regression even. Um, so if you've, uh, if you've ever pulled in data into Excel um, or whatever your favorite spreadsheet based software is and you've done a right click and then a fit, uh, line of best fit, you know, like congratulations, you're doing machine learning. Um, or at least like you're, you're doing something very similar to a regression task, right? Like you, you have um, an input um, and you expect some sort of output and you can make a best guess on that. So y equals mx plus b, that's just another equation. Um, to, to be able to, to predict a specific value. And if anybody has questions as we go through this, please feel free to raise your hand and shout them out. Um, I'll make sure to repeat the question as well for folks on the video. But that's a lot of words on a slide. Uh, so let's try an example, right? Like let's see, uh, let's try to see this in action. So say you work at a bank and your boss comes to you with a CSV file, because it's always a CSV file, um, and he says something to the effect of, we have all of this data, all of this historic data from our customers, right? We have their age, whether or not they have a job, whether or not they own a house, um, their credit rating, how much education they had, and then also whether or not they defaulted on a loan. So when we paid them money, um, when we gave them this uh, sort of a, a grant award of funds, um, did they pay us back when they said that they were supposed to? And really all my boss cares about is that last column, right? The did they default or not on, on this particular, um, on uh, whenever we gave them money. And really, really what he cares about is what is the likelihood of a default from this new potential customer, this 35 year old who has a job, who doesn't own a house, who has bad credit, who went to college, what is the likelihood that they would pay us back on time? Um, and you could do something like build out a decision tree, um, which would have a series of nodes with questions and then also those, those sort of heuristically defined um, numeric values that I was mentioning before. Um, you would follow it through to some sort of eventuality um, and it would say based on historic data, so based on the data from all of the customers that we've seen before, um, we believe that there is a strong likelihood that this guy um, would pay us, back his um, pay us back his money on time. 
Um, so again, with traditional machine learning, you're looking at historic data. You're attempting to make some sort of, um, some sort of intelligent assessment based on historic data. Um, and you aren't expected to look through you know, the tens of thousands of records uh, that, that you have in a database. You, know, you can select an algorithm like a decision tree, and it'll define these particular rules, these thresholds, and these boundaries for you. So this is problematic for a number of reasons, and I'm sure folks in the audience can think of many. So how many of you, are, how many of you do machine learning for your day job? Several hands. How many of you, um, how many of you uh, are hoping to, to delve into machine learning, deep learning, data science? Um, excellent. And then the rest, uh, I guess, sort of how, are, how many of you are sort of um, the data science DevOps type? So you're responsible for dealing with data scientists or machine learning engineers models for deployment. A few hands. Awesome. So, um, so this can be, uh, traditional machine learning methods can be problematic for a number of ways. Um, one of which is that your data is usually never friendly, right? So, so it usually looks a little bit more like this. Um, your ages are never standardized, or your, um, if you have numeric values, they're hardly ever straight ints, um, or you know, hardly ever like float 32s or whatever is most friendly for your, um, the particular framework that you select to, um, to build your model. Um, you often have missing values, um, as, uh, values that aren't necessarily standardized. Um, if, you've ever played, uh, if you've ever played with Unicode, you know, that can also be very frustrating. Um, and then also it comes in a variety of sources. So it could be XML that you need to parse, it could be streaming JSON, um, it could be data stored in tables, um, and you would be expected to sort of, uh, to sort of um, sanitize it, get it into a standardized format, and then create these friendly rectangular structures, which are what most machine learning algorithms need in order to make correct assessments. Um, so, so all of that can be very frustrating. And also other features. Um, so for example, in, our, in, my first, um, in my first slide, I didn't show the amount of money that a person had is in their bank account. Um, and you can imagine that that would probably be the best indicator of whether or not they would pay you back money, is if, they, you know, if, they're, if they're overdrawn on their account, then they probably don't have funds to, to pay back a loan. Um, but that wasn't included. And so you as a data scientist or machine learning engineer would be responsible for um, sort of guessing that that would be useful, hunting down that data source, and then somehow integrating it with the rest of the data that you have as part of your data set. And if your data set had been standardized and, or um, sanitized in some way, so t uh, desensitized as in you don't know the names of the, the folks that you are analyzing, um, it would be really, really hard to have, um, to have some way to tie back that initial data to these additional um, these additional sets. Um, so feature engineering is, is really, really difficult as, as part of a traditional machine learning task. Um, and deep learning, it doesn't give you feature engineering for free, um, but it does relieve some of those concerns. Um, so the takeaway is that traditional machine learning, things like random forest, decision trees, et cetera, um, can be extremely effective, requires less hardware than deep learning. So for example, scikit-learn, um, everything is CPU-based. Um, they don't have GPU support on their roadmap. Um, Carrot is, is kind of similar um, if, if you're an R person. Um, but it requires a great deal of additional work up front and behind the scenes. And it works best for tasks that are very well-defined and specific on structured data. So things like images, videos, et cetera, they aren't very well supported by these methods. And deep learning is the buzzwordiest, right? Like that's probably why we're all here today. Um, uh, so AI, big broad bucket, um, machine learning subset of AI, deep learning subset of machine learning specifically focused on using neural nets to accomplish tasks on data that isn't necessarily structured but could be. Um, and that usually has less well-defined problem spaces, right? So, so deep learning is used in a variety of ways. Um, it can be used on images, as I mentioned before. Um, so here you can see automatically being able to pluck specific entities um, out of a picture and draw a bounding box around it. You can use transfer learning in order to, uh, to find specific human beings in, um, in, in an image. So for example, 
Um, if, you, if you have five, uh, five samples of a human face, you would, be able to, uh, you would be able to pluck out that human from any JPEG or any video footage that that, that person had been in. Um, this is the technology that Facebook uses in order to say like, hey, that looks like Sally um, whenever you upload a photo. Um, it's just because they have a number of examples of that person and they're able to make a pretty accurate assessment that that person is also in the photograph. So how many of you have used transfer learning before? A few hands, excellent. Um, so, so this is uh, this is useful not just for image tasks, um, but for a variety of others. And we'll see a couple of examples later today as well, um, including uh, something called TensorFlow Hub, which gives you um, which gives you the ability to do transfer learning in a variety of spaces. Uh, and then also um, there are applications and things like the biosciences. So being able to detect cancer in cells. Um, very easily you would have, um, so to architect this problem, you would, uh, it would be just as simple as having a folder of cells that were cancerous and a folder that were not, um, and then being able to, to point your algorithm at those two directories and say, hey, learn what constitutes a cancerous cell versus not. Um, and those rules would be defined for you. Text-based uh, text -based examples are also very interesting. Um, and actually, let's take a look at this one. So this is, Deepmoji is one of my most favorite models. Um, it's, uh, it was created by MIT, a group of grad students there. Um, and what they did was they scraped through Twitter. They found millions of tweets, um, 140 characters long. This was before Twitter, you know, sort of expanded out to 280 characters. And what they're doing is they're sort of guessing which emoji uh, would come after some sort of short sentence or short, um, short collection of words. And this is a classification task, but it's also very interesting in that if you've ever done sentiment analysis before, you probably know that it's generally on a zero to one continuous spectrum, which isn't very useful, right? Like if you, if you get back a 0 0.5 as a response, that tells you nothing. Um, the only real value that you can experience from it is if it's super duper negative or super duper positive. And even then, you can't really understand any of the nuanced human emotion that happens from that text snippet, right? So, so what Deepmoji does is it starts giving you insight um, into, into the more human aspect. Um, and you can play with it online as well. So if you wanted um, somebody, give me a, somebody give me a sentence, um, or I guess I could say a sentence. Um, my server just crashed, great, right? And so if you were, um, again, if you were doing sentiment analysis, it might pick up on the great and think that, oh, well, that sounds pretty nice. Uh, that's positive. Uh, this person must be very excited, you know, uh, A++. But if you uh, submit it to Deepmoji, you can see that it, uh, it has pretty high confidence that I'm not too awful pleased. Right, and those are the, the five emoji that would be most likely um, to, to be in, in that response. Um, there could also be something like, this party is lit. Um, let's see what that comes up with. And, and that also, you know, that, it, that seems reasonable. <laughs> And all of the code is available, um, I believe it's beefelbo, deepmoji, um, on GitHub. So all of this is open source, available for you to use for your own personal projects. Um, and it was created using an earlier version of TensorFlow with Keras, um, which, we'll talk about, um, which we'll talk about in a short while. So you're, uh, feel free to, to clone the repo, to modify it to meet your use case, or to just run it. Uh, and it, it should function um, just out of the box. You can also do things, uh, so off to the right, we have some generated Shakespeare. This is what happens when you um, sort of take the entire history of Shakespearean plays, um, put them through a deep learning model. This is taken for, um, from an example that we have on the TensorFlow website. You run it through and it comes up with what shall buy these things were a secret fool that still shall see me with the best in force? Which I don't understand, but it sounds like Shakespeare. So, so it, does, it does a pretty good job. Um, this is using an RNN, 
um, for, for the text classification, or the text generation, rather. And then also things like sound. Um, so being able to, uh, to speak into a phone, like your, um, like your Android phone or your Apple phone, um, and to be able to have text immediately generated, that's from a, a deep learning model. Um, being able to make, uh, to make music, so if you're a musician, being able to strum out a guitar melody and then have a bass accompaniment automatically created and a drum accompaniment, um, this would be through something called Magenta, which is also built using TensorFlow, um, and many more. Um, there's really an entire spectrum of applications, everything from style transfer from paintings um, to reinforcement learning, um, I'm sure that you guys have seen the, the Atari and the Doom simulations, um, as well as Dota 2, the world champions being beat just recently by OpenAI. Um, and then, of course, autonomous driving. So automatically being able to do image segmentation and pluck out uh, you know, cars or trees or roads or things of that nature. Um, and it's become so popular recently because deep learning is more accurate than humans. Um, at classifying images, at doing language translation, voice and sound, we have very specialized hardware. Some of it, like I mentioned, even available for free. Um, everything from GPUs to custom specialized chips like uh, TPUs and also uh, things like FPGAs that you would be expected to, um, to sort of hand code to, uh, to optimize for particular algorithms. Um, and we also have lots and lots of data. And really, the, the more data that you have for your machine learning or deep learning projects, the better off you'll be. Um, so creating your model, or creating your own model, takes a lot of time, data, experience, and hardware. Um, building off someone else's, though, is a little bit easier. Um, and this, uh, we were happy to release a number of modules, a number of new ones, um, at our TensorFlow Developer Summit this past March. So how many of you have heard of TensorFlow Hub, by any chance? A few hands. Um, so what this is, is it's a website, um, and it's just tfhub.dev, um, that gives you the ability to take a lot of, um, so basically all of the models that, that we use at Google um, and all of the model components uh, and to be able to use them for transfer learning tasks. We use this very successfully internally um, for, um, for, most of our, for most of our modeling. Uh, and TensorFlow Hub can do everything from text to image classification and um, feature vectorization, um, video, uh, and uh, also a, a variety of other use cases. But the nice thing is, is that, so say you, um, you want to use embeddings, um, you can use something called the universal sentence encoder, for example. It'll run through um, kind of talking about what the module is capable of, what, it, uh, what it's expected um, to accomplish, um, and then it can take you to a collab notebook for you to play around with it and immediately start using it in your projects. Um, so, since everyone mentioned that uh, they might not necessarily have that much experience with Colab, um, Colab is a, a Jupyter Notebook-like environment uh, available for free on colab.google.com. Um, you're able to create uh, sort of code cells. Um, you can print uh, Hello Spark AI Summit immediately see a response. Um, you can also see that it's connecting up to an instance there. Um, and each one of these uh, sort of more text-friendly cells are just marked down. So you can edit them the same way that you would edit uh, markdown on GitHub or just in general. Um, I mentioned before that you can change runtimes. So to do that, it's just as simple as runtime, change runtime type. Um, you can select Python 3 or Python 2 or even Swift now. Um, we have a Swift kernel available for Swift for TensorFlow and then a hardware accelerator. So it can either be a CPU, um, which is what I'm using now, which is why it's kind of slow, um, or it can be a GPU or even a TPU. Um, and again, all kind of available for free. Uh, you can also or upload custom files and connect to data sources. Um, so. Uh, Google Cloud Storage if you want, a Drive instance if you want, or if you're using um, sort of buckets on AWS or uh, sort of storage on Azure, 
all of those would be options as well. You can also connect to a local runtime as opposed to a hosted runtime, um, and it's just as simple as, as changing the connection settings there. Um, so strongly suggest taking a look at this guy uh, if, you, if you haven't experimented with Colab already. There are also a whole bunch of example notebooks um, just available for free online, and all of our examples on tensorflow.org are runnable in Colab environments. Cool, 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 cool. Um, and then deploying a canned model um, would be even easier than uh, would be even easier than doing model components. Um, and we'll see an example of that later. So just, uh, you already saw an example of Deepmoji being used um, that had already been trained and the inferencing was very, very quick. You didn't have to retrain on additional data. Um, a number of models are readily available for you to start using for your projects as well. And TensorFlow 2.0, what is it actually? And why should you care? Um, TensorFlow, when it was originally announced in 2015, was uh, sort of uh, an event that, uh, you know, crashed hacker news uh, or something. Like, it, it got an explosion of likes on GitHub. It got a lot of attention. Um, and it was really just one singular repo. It was a numerical computing framework that we'd used at Google for a large number of years. Um, under a variety of names, so Sybil and Disbelief. And it's what powers every single machine learning algorithm that we have in every Google product. So if you're using search, if you're using Gmail and you see it autocomplete, if you're speaking into your phone and it does the text generation, um, all of that is using TensorFlow. Uh, so uh, the, having it open sourced and having it available for the world to use is, is kind of miraculous. Um, right, and it was intended to be a machine learning platform for everyone to solve real problems. So not just the things that we see at Google, but also um, in a variety of other applications. Um, it's, since then, it's become the number one repository for machine learning on GitHub, the number one most loved library or framework in, on Stack Overflow, and nobody loves anything on Stack Overflow. Um, so, so it's just uh, been really, really, um, been really, really exciting to see this traction from the community. Um, and those are the locations of all of the GitHub stars. Uh, you know, around the world, uh, we we sort of showed this at the the March um, Dev Summit, and we're very curious as to why somebody was doing deep learning in Antarctica, but um, you know, like uh, deep learning on penguins. And the 41 million downloads, 50,000 commits, you know, lots and lots of friendly numbers because everybody loves metrics, right? Like just a, a, an explosion of popularity. Um, but the really cool thing is that since it's been, um, since it was open sourced in 2015, um, the ecosystem has grown kind of exponentially. So instead of just having one repo, we now have 80. And we have a collection of tooling for doing anything that you would want to do um, with a deep learning model, and it's growing every single day. So things, everything that you could think of, um, so not just uh, TensorFlow on a single CPU or a single GPU, but across clusters with distribution strategies, across clusters of, of uh, TPUs even, um, with TPU estimators. Um, we've integrated Keras. Uh, we have eager execution, TensorFlow Lite for mobile and embedded devices, integration with cloud products, everything from Amazon's Kinesis to Bigtable from Google Cloud, and CUDA support as well. Uh, so, so like I said, it, it's been really, really interesting um, to see what the community has built as opposed to, to just, what, uh, just what Google open sourced initially. And we do use it very successfully internally, everything from uh, sort of um, powering our data center efficiency to doing localization in Google Maps, to perfecting pixels, um, pixels portrait mode. Awesome. And a uh, variety of ways. But the community's done even cooler things. So here you see an example of a custom beat generator created with TensorFlow.js um, that's just a code pin example. Um, so this was created, the entire application was created with about 300 lines of code. Um, and it's displayable in a browser, and it's running a custom model. Um, and the way you would do that is just through a script tag. So I mentioned before um, that we have this thing called TensorFlow.js, and I just want to point it out in particular. Um, this is uh, tensorflow.org slash JS. 
on our website. Um, if you click See Demos, um, you'll see a variety of options. Um, so everything from an emoji scavenger hunt that you can play um, in a browser on your phone or on your computer, um, a Pac-Man game that you can self-train, um, the performance RNN, which was what I showed you before, um, but then also this one, and hopefully I won't kill myself as I like uh, edge closer to the edge of the stage. Um, but if you wanted to try this, um, this particular model called PoseNet, um, you should be able to. And there we go. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna try not to fall off the stage. Otherwise, that would be a very interesting video. Um, but, uh, but it's automatically detecting specific locations of features on my body. So it can detect my arms, my torso. Um, if it could see my legs, it would be able to see those as well. Um, but if I move in a little bit closer, uh, it can pick out specific locations, my eyes, um, my ear locations, uh, and this is all out of the box. And if you take a look at the code that's used to run this particular experiment, using the model out of the box is just as simple as inserting a script tag. Um, so, so that's really, really powerful, right? And that this model has been generated it's running in a browser, so it's not compute intensive. Um, it's very, very lightweight in terms of both the time that it takes to inferencing, it's pretty near time, um, and then it's, all, or pretty real time rather, and uh, the amount of compute it needs is very, very minimal. Um, the nice thing too about TensorFlow.js is that if you wanted to do transfer learning in your browser, you could, um, and since they've added support for um, since they've added support for node bindings, um, you would even be able to use a GPU on your laptop um, if your laptop did not get like unbearably hot to touch um, uh, just through a browser, which is, which is kind of magnificent. Cool. And let me check time. So we still have a little bit left before the first break. Um, so that was an example from more of an artistic space using TensorFlow.js. Um, this is an example from DeepMind um, entering in, um, entering a model that they built called AlphaFold to a protein folding um, competition. And I didn't know that there was like a protein folding Olympics, but apparently there is. Uh, and it was the first time that they had ever entered a deep learning model, first time anybody had. And they were able to blow sort of the accuracy of experts, um, expert researchers' models out of the water uh, just by, uh, just by um, sort of the, the nature of, of um, building a predictive model and training it against, um, training against very, very specialized hardware. And this is sort of exciting to me and that there are so many natural sciences spaces. I come from, um, so my background, I was geophysics and applied math, um, and then carbonate geology, and being able to take deep learning and to apply it to these complex problem spaces that humans haven't really been able to crack into to their full potential. Um, so an example, again, is the biosciences, but then also certainly climate change, um, subsurface modeling, um, those sorts of things um, is really, really powerful. So suddenly being able to, um, to extract insights from these high dimensional data sets uh, is huge. So the original version of TensorFlow, and how many of you have used it before? Okay, cool. So I'm sorry, like um, the, the <laughs> uh, and please don't tell my boss I said that, but, the, um, but in 2015, uh, this is what it looked like. And if you're a Python person, this is not intuitive at all, right? Like, so you would be expected to create some variables up at the top, but you couldn't use them, right? Like they were just there, you know, like just waiting for them to, to be used. Like if you, if you typed in um, that you wanted to have a placeholder, um, you know, with, the, with a bunch of floats, and then, uh, and you wanted to call it X, and you click, and then you typed in X and hit enter. You wouldn't really get anything useful back. Um, to use these variables, you would have to create this wonky thing called a session, which made zero sense. And then you would have to initialize the variables. Then you would have to start these queue runners for your session. 
Um, and then you would have to figure out how to um, sort of batch your data in an efficient manner um, in order to use it as part of your model. So this, this thing right here, um, just this, this very small experiment, uh, was very frustrating, especially to someone who was coming from scikit-learn where you could build a complete model with like five lines of code. Um, and it was very friendly. It worked with all of the, it worked with all of the, the sort of data manipulation libraries that you're familiar with, like pandas or um, pandas or the rest. So the original version of TensorFlow, TensorFlow circa 2015, was very, very frustrating for Python developers. It was like a distributed systems engineer idea of what a, a Python programmer would want. Um, and it, it was just not the, the friendliest sort of experience. But the good news is that we've learned a lot since 1.0. Um, and uh, if you wanna try 2.0 alpha today, you absolutely can. Um, I mentioned before that we have collabs, uh, collabs available for free. I encourage all of you um, to go to a collab environment uh, using Python 3 and to, to pip install TensorFlow. Um, the nice thing too about collab environments is that if you want to use a kind of Linux command line tooling within them, all you would have to do is preface this statement with, a, with an exclamation point. Um, and you would be able to pip install. You would also be able to do um, things like, uh, oh gosh, let me go back and see if it's, if it's still running. So get rid of this guy. You would be able to do things like um, bang lsal, and it lists out all of the, um, so all of the, the folders in your, in your environment. Um, and you can also grep in files, uh, which is really, really nifty. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so strongly encourage you to do a bang pip install um, pre u TensorFlow, and that should, um, that should begin the process of grabbing it from PyPy. Um, and again, just wanna say this is alpha. We should be releasing an RC um, in a bit. And why is this different than the original code snippet that I showed you? Well, for starters, we've taken this higher level API called Keras, um, which is very user friendly. You'll see an example of it in a moment, and made it the default and recommended higher level API. So instead of having to, um, to intimately know all the raw operations that are very low level for TensorFlow, um, you're able to use a higher level API to access those. And it's just 10 lines of code to create something kind of magic. And we've also created it with eager execution by default. So if you're a Python person, um, you can do crazy things like add two numbers together, right? And, uh, and immediately get a response, right? Instead of having to create um, the variables, define how they would be used, and then sort of initialize and run them. Um, so if you've, if you've played with PyTorch, if you've played with scikit-learn, it will feel very similar. We've also removed duplicate functionality. So one of the bits of feedback that we heard quite a bit was there are uh, you know, five different ways to do something in TensorFlow. Like tell me what the canonical way is and make that, you know, like follow the Python best practices of having one way to do something. Um, and we've taken the 4,500 or so um, endpoints that were previously available and condensed them and also bucketized them into sort of understandable chunks. So instead of having a lot of things like tf.foo, now we have tf.signal.foo or tf.math.foo. Um, we've also made the syntax intuitive across all of the APIs. In addition to modularizing TensorFlow, so instead of having this big bulky thing, um, if you just wanna use one specific bit of functionality, you can. So if you're just interested in probabilistic, um, probabilistic deep learning, if you're just interested in Bayesian methods, you don't have to download the entirety of TensorFlow and all of its ecosystem. Um, all you have to do is download something called TensorFlow Probability, and that's a pip installable package. It's very friendly. And we've also made it compatible throughout the entire TensorFlow ecosystem. Um, if you liked the original TensorFlow, uh, that's, Fine, um, all of the functionality, well, you know, uh, to each his own or her own. Um, but all of the internal ops are still accessible through raw ops. But you should be able to do most of the things that you would want to do with Keras and with subclassing Keras. 
Um, and we've also made inheritable interfaces for variables, checkpoints, and layers. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm being told that I, have, I am not allowed to keep you captive. Um, though I would love to, to have all of, all of us here together for forever. Um, but, the, uh, but if you need a bathroom break, if you need to grab some water, um, when you come back, we'll talk a lot more about what Keras looks like and then also how you would go about subclassing it to meet your more low-level needs. Um, so if you had experience with Keras before, it probably felt very um, sort of restrictive, very rigid in terms of capability. Um, if you do use subclassing, you're able to do things like variational autoencoders, um, very, um, very straightforward. So come back, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, awesome. Excellent, thank you. If you want, you can have them ask some questions. Yeah, are... if anybody wants to ask questions, um, instead of going and grabbing water or going to the restroom, um, feel free to come ask. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And please use the mic in the middle if you have questions. Okay. Cool. Pretty good. Yeah. Hey, so um, you know, question, right? So um, you know, with the Keras API, like with the TensorFlow API, you're actually mm -hmm. able to do uh, things that are a lot more granular, like you know, pin what operation on what device, right? Right. I think that you know, with the Keras API, do you lose that? Or like, you know, so with the Keras, um, the question was uh, with the low-level TensorFlow API, you're able to do um, sort of uh, much more granular and control type things, like being able to say, I want these operations to run on this device. Um, and the, the short answer is yes, it's more difficult with Keras. Um, and we would, uh, we would recommend that you use raw ops instead for those particular tasks. Um, but there are also, uh, you can build custom strategies with distribution strategy if you, if you wish to. Um, and we'll get into the how to, to build a distribution strategy, or at least a pointer to how to build a distribution strategy later. Am I allowed to ask more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh -huh. right. so, uh, with, uh, you know, so it seems like online, because I just like, you know, um, basically uh, brought something to production for you know, my particular you know, uh, employer now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we use actually, so you know, it's on Windows, and mm -hmm. this wasn't supported on Windows, I had to like, right. build you know, it from the source, and then like, you know, basically, you know, the DLLs ready, mm -hmm. and then like you know, pull into it and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like the um, recommended approach is to actually use TensorFlow Survey, but typically when I see like you know tutorials online, mm -hmm. it seems to be running within a Docker container, which is a separate process, right? Mm -hmm. Or is that or am I completely being misled or like just I'm being stupid and I just don't understand anything? No, no, no. So um, the question was: Is the recommendation to use TensorFlow Serving, or is it to package up a model and then deploy it uh, in a way that you can? you can sort of ping in a Docker container. So uh, to package up a model as a Dockerized container and then ping it like a REST API. Is that the kind of well, tutorial that you see? like the online tutorials are saying like, you know, you should use TensorFlow Serving because it's more optimized. And then, but then the tutorials that I've seen are all, you know, within the Docker container, mm -hmm. which is a separate process. But yeah. the thing is that, you know, the application that I'm, you know, working on it's actually like a rich client application. Yeah. So like, you know, the, that means you have to do IPC or like, you know. It's yeah, like it's not gRPC or, or, or whatever, like yeah. the, yeah. yeah. It's I, I, RPC, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and so, so the recommendation that the TensorFlow team does have is to use TensorFlow serving if you can. Um, and if you cannot, then um, a way to deploy it would be through the Dockerized container or you could do um, TensorFlow.js. So the nice thing about this, um, and I guess we'll get into it a little bit later, but you, ha you see everything through saved model. Um, and then all of it can be deployed. Um, if you're using it for a mobile device, your model can be run directly on a phone or on like an Arduino or like one of the little spark fun uh, tiny guys, the red pills. Um, or you could run it directly in a browser on a server um, with TensorFlow.js. So TensorFlow.js allows you to run it directly on a server. Um, and then uh, you can also do TensorFlow serving if you wish without having to containerize anything. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, but it's, that's the recommendation is that you port out your model. Um, so you, you port it out to TensorFlow Lite, to TensorFlow.js or TensorFlow serving. Yep, yep. I've got to give other people a chance to ask. Cool, 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 later. yep. So um, I actually have to do a presentation about the Andrew TensorFlow. Oh, sweet. 
Uh, and I thought some of the, the information mentioned in the PowerPoint was pretty amazing. Is, is, is there a way I could access if we have access to this? So I, I'm, I would be happy to share PDFs. Um, and uh, I can't share the slides because the, the template is, is kind of restricted use, but I can sh certainly share PDFs. Okay, and yeah. like, uh, is it going to be on the Spark uh, Summit website or how? Yes, it should okay. be on the Spark Summit website. Okay. And I'll also tweet out a link too. Sounds awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Also, the recording will be available on the website, so if you actually want to watch it, you can watch it. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Sure. Um, it, everything should be available on tensorflow.org slash alpha. Okay. Yep. And yep, all of the lots and lots of links to tutorials, quick starts, guides, and then also um, everything should have a big shiny open and collab button. And you click open and collab and it takes you to, to collab for the thing. <laughs> Bless you. So Keras supports a variety of neural network architectures out of the box. Um, if you want to build a more custom, um, so like if you're building a GAN, you can certainly build it with Keras. Um, uh, like there, there are a lot of examples of, um, so like DC GAN, I think we have um, SR GAN. Um, so I, I'm not, if you don't see it on the GitHub, then we don't have an example for it created at GitHub or created it from Google. Um, but you can do a lot of interesting things with subclass models. I do know that there are some people, um, if they want to do very bespoke deep learning, um, if they want to, to do things like um, changing, changing their loss halfway through or changing specific values, um, then, then they would do it with raw ops as opposed to Keras. Like the level. The, the uh, TensorFlow API, the, the lower level stuff. Yeah, okay. um, but the nice thing is, is that if you want to do high level things, then you have the option with Keras out of the box. If you want to go a little bit lower, um, um, but still basically using Keras for user friendliness, then you can do subclassing. And then if you want to go super low, you can still do raw ops. The subclassing? Yeah. Uh, what now? Uh, it's on the website okay. for tensorflow.org slash alpha. And Thank there you. should be a, um, you'll also see an example in the slides for a BAE. Thank yep. you. Yep. Excellent. It's showing 80% is still here in the room. Oh, wow. I actually have a, I actually have a question now. Mm -hmm. This is a kind of a new kind of a question. But the thing is, when you have, I mean, why do people use neural networks only for images and videos? I mean, if it was large scale data frame level kind of data. Yeah. Oh, you could still absolutely use neural networks for structured data. There was actually one that I was going to show um, that was just like a very simple, uh, a very simple uh, car mileage example. Um, so y you can fit it with a linear model, but you can also get the same result um, with a neural network. And does it work faster potentially with the power of the network? So, so I will say that most. Um, so a large number of models that we use internally are linear models. Um, and it, if, you're, if you're doing data at scale, um, then, or if you're, if you're doing inferencing at scale, then, uh, then sometimes there are advantages. Um, but it's, again, it's, it, it's the best tool for the task. So, so you can't have like a prescriptive, you should always use this. Um, it's always based on your data, based on your use case, and then based on the constraints that you have for deployment and also training. Gotcha. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So yes. Uh -huh. So it'll be more code heavy than the one on Tuesday, um, and we'll go into a little bit of um, we'll go into a little bit of uh, how you would do subclassing for Keras, and then also. Um, what is the difference between control flow in 1.x and 2.0? Yep. That brings us to time. So we'll get started with the second half. Again, if there are any questions in this session, I'd highly recommend using the mics in the middle. Thank you. Cool. So uh, I guess everybody, everybody's back. Um, the, the higher level architecture th diagram that you see here is probably drastically different than that of you that you would expect. 
from um, TensorFlow 1.x. Um, there are a number of ways to save models previously, and none of them were at all straightforward. None of them were uh, none of them were particularly recommended. And someone asked a question a little bit earlier about you know I see serving listed as kind of the the way that it's recommended to deploy a model, um, but then I look in at all the tutorials online and everybody's playing with things like Docker containers and tell me about all this complexity and, and why on earth is it the case? Uh, so with 2.0, we've tried to reduce the complexity a bit. Um, the entire training process, um, after you've created your model, after you've gotten it to an accuracy that you enjoy, um, that your boss is okay with, um, then you deploy it as a saved model. Um, and then saved model can be used across TensorFlow serving, um, it can be used with TensorFlow Lite for mobile and embedded devices out of the box. So if you want to run a model directly on your phone, you can. Um, if you've wondered why, uh, whenever you speak into an Android phone, if you just recently updated it, why is it so much quicker now to uh, register what you're saying? It's because instead of having to go and ping a server somewhere, um, now the model is directly on device. So all of your data never leaves your phone. Um, it just uh, it just stays um, it stays kind of constrained to to this local environment, and it's using a GPU. Um, if you have a Pixel two or a Pixel three, um, that's directly on device to do the inferencing, which is kind of exciting. Like you have deep learning, you know, neural networks in your phones and all of your your favorite hardware devices, um, and also TensorFlow JS. So if you wanted to deploy to a browser, you could. If you wanted to deploy to a server, you could also do that. Um, and we also have support for a number of other languages. So C, Rust, Java, R, um, uh, pretty much pick your poison. I think there's even C sharp and F sharp language bindings, which is, which is kind of cool if you come from the .NET space. Um, these powerful API components fit together for the entire training workflow. So you have TF data for data ingestion, which makes dealing with CSVs quite a bit easier. Um, feature columns, if you like feature columns. I've mentioned Keras before, but if you like estimators, they're still around, and if you wanna do custom modeling, you can still do that as well. Um, you can use uh, eager execution in something called Autograph for training, um, as well as distribution strategies and TensorBoard to visualize it, and then for the serving component, it's all saved model and then to wherever you want to deploy your model. And if you want to look at an example, um, so this is something with, that we just released called TensorFlow Datasets. Uh, and this should look very familiar if you're from the scikit-learn space. Uh, so instead of having to have you know, 300 lines of boilerplate code in order to ingest something as simplistic as a table in a database or a CSV file, um, now all you have to do is something like this. And TensorFlow Datasets is available on GitHub completely for free. Um, and it has a large number of datasets that are useful across academia and then also across industry for training models um, to, get the, to get the kind of accuracy that you would like. And that's all you would have to do in order to call it. You would define a training and test set um, and, then, and then use it. And I believe we have something to the effect of like 90 data sets available right now, free for you to use. Um, we're hoping to get all of the data sets that are available on Kaggle um, as well. Um, and uh, we've also created a data set builder. Um, so if it follows a specific template, you're able to ingest, uh, you're able to all, uh, ingest all of the data in a consistent way. Um, so, so strongly suggest taking a look at TensorFlow datasets if you haven't, um, if you haven't already. So, TensorFlow also really, really loves Keras, uh, which makes me happy. Uh, it was the only thing that made TensorFlow sort of easy to use um, before um, before I before I came to Google. Um, and to build a model, uh, you might have noticed that with the previous example, um, there was a lot of boilerplate, none of it was very intuitive. Now to build and deploy a model, um, it's that many lines of code, so about 10. Uh, you, create, um, you create a training and test data set, um, you define some layers, you can probably guess if you've had any sort of deep learning tutorial, this is an example of MNIST. Uh, the, the digit recognizer from zero to nine. Um, you can, the, the dead giveaway is the 10 for the 10 different categories and the softmax activation, which tells you it's a classification problem. 
Um, you would compile your model using an optimizer, a loss, and define some metrics that you care about. All of these are available out of the box, but you can also do custom loss functions. You can build custom optimizers. Um, you would fit your model, and here we're going over the data for five epics, and then you would evaluate it on your test data set. But that's all. Like, if you want to do deep learning, there you go. However many, however many lines that happens to be. Um, they're also quite computationally expensive. And since we're Google, we have to make everything scale, right? Like that's, that's kind of a non-starter if we can't. Um, so we also heard from the initial version of TensorFlow that it was okay to do deep learning on you know, a single CPU, a single GPU, a single TPU. Um, but then when you tried to scale it across you know, multiple GPUs or multiple nodes with GPUs or TPUs, um, it got very frustrating and very confusing very quickly. Um, now, if you want to scale your model across a cluster of machines, it's just as simple as adding those two lines of code. So you place your model within a distribution strategy. You can also create custom strategies if you would prefer to train um, in, a, in a very specific way, um, as opposed to the one that's defined out of the box. Um, and you place your model in a strategy scope and you're off to the races. Um, so if you, want to do, um, if you want to do distributed deep learning across a cluster of devices, that's, um, that's all you would need to specify. Um, I mentioned before that we have TensorFlow Hub available for you to use as well for everything from text um, to, um, to images to videos. Um, and they're all kind of available out of the box and ready with collab examples so that you can go and use them for your own use cases. Um, Keras and Estimator offer high-level building blocks um, as an easy-to-use package, but when you need more control, um, when you're exploring new kinds of algorithms, you can also uh, need something like subclassing, or you might want custom loops with custom variables. And this is supported as well as part of Keras. So say you wanted to build a custom encoder for machine translation. Um, here's how you do this by subclassing the model. And the focus is on implementing the computational algorithm as opposed to, um, to sort of thinking about the complexity of an API, right? Like we, uh, the focus of Francois, um, who's the author of Keras, he works at Google, was that we want it to fit the same mental model that you would have for architecting with just Keras, um, but adding a specific logic to, to, um, to sort of make it a, a little bit more custom. Um, and you can even customize the training loop to get full control over gradient computations in the optimization process. Uh, so, so again, this is a lot less complex than you would experience in TensorFlow 1.whatever. Um, but it's, it's available as Keras subclassing um, in 2.0. And also it's useful to visualize training um, and to visualize kind of your performance over time. And with TensorBoard, um, this is a, sort of an out of the box solution for you to analyze your histograms, your performance, your precision, um, and to even be able to start asking really interesting questions about whether your model is, is biased. Um, so there's, uh, there's a tool within TensorBoard called the What If tool. I strongly suggest you go and take a look at it. Um, but it helps guide you towards um, the, the kinds of questions that you can make on your data to determine that, there, um, that uh, one particular group or one particular um, subset uh, or class in your model isn't being um, sort of discriminated against as, as part of your training. Um, you can also create custom plugins for TensorBoard, um, and we're making it easier than ever to do so. Um, so if you have interest in sort of joining the discussion or um, sort of driving the direction of the build out of this tool, we have a special interest group, and I strongly suggest that you take it out, uh, check it out for TensorBoard. And even cooler, uh, TensorBoard is now embeddable within Jupyter Notebooks and Colab examples. So instead of you having to do like the weird localhost 6006 shenanigans, um, it's, in, it's available for you to use directly in a notebook. And not just Colab Notebooks, but also Jupyter Notebooks and notebooks on whatever cloud environment that you choose. Uh, Keras callbacks even include full profiling for your model. So that way you can understand model performance and device placement, and you can also find ways to minimize bottlenecks. This is visualized within Colab for CPUs, for GPUs, and then also for TPUs. 
Um, and again, sort of out of the box and all for free. Um, we've also worked to build out the documentation, um, so API documentation as well as quick starts, tutorials, and examples. And if there's something that you want to see that doesn't exist, um, please file an issue as a feature request on GitHub and we'll, we'll try to get to it as quickly as we can. Um, we've also, uh, so I showed an example using PoseNet before. Um, TensorFlow.js has become wildly popular both in um, education and then also for sort of those creative developments that I was talking about before. But it's also kind of magical to think about the applications that you can have just with the out-of-the-box models, right? So when you see this, um, you might automatically think of, well, oh, it would be really cool to have um, the ability to track my movements as I'm doing yoga poses or as I'm working out. So it would be able to tell me if my posture is, is something that's unsafe. Or if you have a group of construction workers that are attempting to accomplish some task, um, being able to make sure that they are doing it in a safe way as opposed to a way that could hurt their back. Um, and then also if you're wanting to build the latest and greatest Snapchat thing, right? Like being able to put a puppy face on a people face or whatever, being able to automatically spot the locations of eyes and ears and noses and mouths instead of having to hard code that um, is also very powerful. Uh, researchers, if anybody here is in sort of the academic space, um, we've noticed kind of an explosion of TensorFlow usage for research um, in the past year, so number of mentions and then um, in both Archive and Science Direct um, as well as in Google Scholar. Um, and we also believe that powerful experimentation begins with flexibility. Um, so again, the focus is on eager execution, and in TensorFlow 2.0, by default, um, every command is immediately executed. Uh, this helps a lot with debugging, but it's also very, very different than what you would expect with 1.0. Um, so even if, the, even if the code looks very similar, um, the control flow is running eagerly. Uh, so as you iterate through eager mode, you'll eventually want to distribute your code onto GPUs and TPUs and other hardware. And for this, we have something called TF function, um, which allows you to toggle between eager execution and then building a static graph. So if you like dynamic computations, um, that's supported. If you like static graphs, also supported. And TF function usually gives you a really, really cool performance increase um, whenever you wrap your functions within it. Uh, and you can do that with any Python function. So it doesn't just have to be TensorFlow ops. Uh, it can be anything. Um, you'll get all of the familiar tools like Python control flow, asserts, and even print. Um, but you can convert to a graph anytime you need to. And even with this, you get great debugging. And debuggability is uh, great for functions and then also for graphs. So we've been trying to improve error messages as much as we can. Um, for this example, we're splitting a tensor using TF function and it creates a graph, but because of the mismatched inputs, you, uh, you get an error. And as you can see, we give users the information about the file and the line number in particular where the error occurred in the model. Um, we tried to make the error messages a lot more concise and a lot more actionable um, and also a lot more understandable. Uh, and if you had experienced error messages before, like the, the double curly braces uh, for, uh, for TensorFlow, they, they were usually almost impossible to debug unless you were familiar with like kernel programming. And that ain't me. Uh, so, and I, I don't know how many other Python folks are, are super into low level, um, low level stuff either. But uh, we hope that you like the error message changes. And again, if you see something that doesn't make sense, file an issue and we'll try to make it better. Performance is also really, really important, right? And we know it's a um, product area that researchers and then also people in industry care about. So um, since last year, which was, I guess, like version 1.8, we've sped up a training on eight NVIDIA Tesla V100s by almost double. Um, by using a Google Cloud TPU, we've boosted performance by 1.6. And with Intel um, MKL acceleration, we've gotten an inference speed up by more than three times. Um, with automatic uh, mixed precision or AMP, uh, you can see also really, really impressive performance increases on GPUs. And it will continue to be a huge focus of 2.0 and a core part of our progress um, to final release. Uh, we've also expanded the ecosystem. I think I mentioned that before. So things like TF probability for probabilistic deep, model, um, deep learning, TF agents for reinforcement learning, tensor to tensor for sort of out of the box and single line deployment of models. Um, this is uh, really, really interesting, especially for doing performance analysis. TF ranking for, um, for 
wild guess, ranking things, right? Like you, you have a corpus of, you have a, a catalog of assets within, um, within your business and being able to rank it automatically. Um, TF text for natural language processing, federated for secure computation and privacy as well. So if you wanna be able to um, kind of support and respect uh, your user's data and to um, make it so that all of the, the sort of model retraining and all of the inferencing can be done in a completely edge way um, without having any of the data sent back to any sort of centralized location for model retrain. Um, you can now do that with federated and with privacy. Um, and to make those real world applications a reality, um, those are, I think I already mentioned the, the different options that you have for, for serving. Um, now it's, it's a lot more friendlier to, to pick up a model and to port it to wherever you need it to be. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's a mobile phone, an embedded device, a browser, or a server. Uh, we've also got something called TensorFlow Extended. Uh, and this is the reason why I came to Google, to be perfectly honest. Um, so one of the biggest frustrations that you have when trying to deploy models in industry um, is that you can create something and it can be beautiful, right? Like you can, you can build this model with Python, um, it can have pretty great accuracy, really, really impressive performance. Your boss gives you a thumbs up and it puts it on your perf and he's like, yeah, you know, you're, you're A plus this year or whatever. Um, and then it comes time to deploy the model and you hand it off to the DevOps team or to whoever's sort of responsible for um, placing it in an, in an application um, so that people can actually use it to accomplish something useful. And more often than not, the lovely model that you wrote in Python using scikit-learn or um, in R using something like Carrot is refactored into Java or to C++. Your accuracy tanks. Um, it's really difficult to, um, to sort of update over time. It's difficult to monitor. It's difficult to, um, to sort of understand what initial data went into creating the model um, and to be able to spot differences between input data that's used for retraining purposes. Um, and if any of the input data that you're getting for inferencing deviates from what you're expected to see whenever you created your model, it doesn't flag you with any warnings out of the box. Um, so it's really, really frustrating to be able to have this great system where you can create a model and then the process for getting it to being actually useful um, requires a lot of glue code, requires a lot of frustration, and is really, really difficult to maintain over time. Um, so, so TensorFlow Extended is what we use at Google internally. Um, and it sort of meets all of those needs. And in March of this year, we open sourced the entire thing. Um, so all of it is now available for you to use. It had been available kind of piecemeal before, um, but now we have uh, sort of open sourced the entire platform. You have things like data validation to make sure that the data that's coming in for your, um, for your inferencing and then also for your model retraining is similar to the one, uh, similar to the data that was used to train it initially. Um, so you have the same sort of distributions for each feature. You have the same sort of thresholds and boundaries for each feature. Um, you have transform for doing full pass um, uh, sort of modifications to data if you need to standardize it or normalize it. Um, if uh, you also have um, the ability to train, obviously, um, the ability to do analysis on your model to make sure your accuracy or whatever metric that you care about is still what it needs to be. Um, and then also to automate the process of serving it. So every single step in this process is automated. Um, you create your model once, you deploy it, and then you build a sustainable, um, sort of safe way uh, to keep it up to date over time. Um, and like I said, all of this is open source. Um, you can use it on whatever infrastructure you care about, whether it's uh, your own sort of private on-prem stuff or in a cloud environment. Um, this is uh, an example of using it with Kubeflow, which is also open source, um, and Airflow. But uh, like I said, you can use it on any cloud service provider or on-prem if you choose. Um, and it's also a phenomenal paper that was released in, I believe, 2017 um, with KDD Nuggets. Uh, I highly recommend um, TensorFlow Extended and then also another paper called The High Interest Credit Card Debt of Machine Learning, uh, which is also a delightful read. 
And, and I don't normally say that like academic papers are delightful reads. So like these are, these are two gems. And then uh, we've also focused on speed for TF Lite. Um, so here you can see some examples of performance increases there. Um, 124 milliseconds on CPUs, and then very, very quick for inferencing on edge TPUs. Edge TPUs are also available for you to purchase now through Coral. Um, so if you want to use them for your, um, for your on-prem uh, on use cases, you absolutely can. And so to recap everything that we've shown you so far, um, TensorFlow has grown to a full ecosystem. Right, from research to production, from server to mobile, lots and lots of different languages supported. And n now the, the question that you're all probably interested in, right, is like, how do I upgrade? Um, and what does that look like and how frustrating is it gonna be? Like, you sold me on this, this sounds useful, right? Like, this Keras stuff sounds pretty nifty. Um, what if I have existing TensorFlow models? How frustrating is it going to be to get them into a, uh, sort of way that they can work with 2.0. And the good news is, is that we're trying to make upgrading as easily as possible. Um, even though upgrades are never like 100% easy, um, we're trying to support in every way that we can because you guys aren't gonna be the, uh, just the only ones upgrading. Um, at this moment in time, every single other engineering team within Google is upgrading all of their models that are running Gmail and such. Uh, and we also, you know, don't want our, the guy that sits next to, or at least I don't want the, my coworkers to get angry at me because that would be um, very, very sad. But we have an escape to backwards compatibility mode. Um, so if there is an endpoint that you're using as part of TensorFlow 1.x that doesn't necessarily exist in 2.0, um, you can always uh, use it with tf.compat.v1. This doesn't include a package called contrib, um, contrib was labeled as volatile code um, and community contributed. So, uh, so that will not be available, but you can always just download contrib and have it locally hosted as well if you, if you really do need to use it. Um, we've created migration guides and best practices, and most importantly, we've created a conversion script. Uh, so you aren't responsible for making any of the changes at all. Um, the script does it for you. And the way that it works, um, is you export a Python file or a Jupyter notebook, so a .py or a .pymb. Um, you run the upgrade utility on it, doing something like tf upgrade v2 and then the input file name or the input tree, and uh, so the input directory, and then you name the output directory. And what it spits back out is a collection of upgraded files and then also something called report.txt which tells you that some symbols have been renamed. So again, I mentioned that instead of having things like tf.multinomial, we now have um, sort of a, a tf.random.categorical feature, which sounds a little bit more, um, well, it, it's, more, uh, it's more straightforward to understand what the endpoint is doing, whereas tf.multinomial could be a variety of things. Um, we also tell you when we added keywords, um, and also whenever the symbols were, uh, whenever the symbols were migrated that could not have like a one-to-one -one replacement within 2.0. So here you can say tf.enable your execution is changed to tf.compat.v1 um, and tf.train atom optimizer has, has changed as well. You could also use the Keras version of the atom optimizer if you so chose. Um, but if you just want to make sure that everything's apples to apples, you could, you could always try the Compat V1 version. And that's it. Uh, and you should be able to run the model just as expected. And if you see any performance degradation or any sort of degradation in terms of your accuracy, um, then that's a bug and you should file it and we will fix it. And that's the upgrade process. Unfortunately, your 1.x code will not run, you know, just completely out of the box because, again, sessions no longer exist. Um, those feed dicks no longer exist. The weird, wonky hparam stuff can now just be Python dicks, and that's fine. Um, and, like, instead of having to do, you know, 12 lines of code to iterate through a list, um, now you can just use Python list comprehensions, and it's much friendlier. Uh, so, but all of those changes are, are kind of, um, 
at least the higher level changes are made for you. And if you want to learn more, um, there are tutorials, migration guides, detailed documentation, all of the example notebooks that I showed you um, at tensorflow.org slash alpha. Um, huge number of resources growing all the time. Um, and we anticipate to release an RC in spring, um, whatever that happens to be. Uh, I've, I've been told that spring is a very nebulous concept. So, um, but, the, but the idea is that we're re releasing an RC quite soon. And then we should have the, the final version of 2.0 by the end of the year. Um, we've also decided to make all of our progress transparent and sort of easily accessible to anybody in the community. Uh, so if there's a particular feature or a particular issue that you care about, you can track it um, and respond directly or correspond directly with TensorFlow engineers. If you file a comment on a GitHub issue, somebody from our team will respond to it. Um, and again, all of this progress is uh, sort of trackable um, just on GitHub as, as in a top level TensorFlow organization project. And TensorFlow 2.0 is really all about community. So I mentioned before that Google was the, um, the entity to sort of give TensorFlow the numerical computing framework to the world. Um, since then, we've, um, you know, sort of been delighted by all of the things that everybody else has created and used it for, right? And it, it, this next iteration is, is really about all, all of us working together to make it a great open source project, not just for deep learning, but also for traditional machine learning and also for, um, you know, web applications, mobile applications, um, and even numeric computation. So if you want to do matrix factorization, right, like that's an option as well. Um, we are doing something called Google Summer of Code this summer. Um, so we're having 20 undergraduate and graduate students that are being given a stipend all around the world, everywhere from, um, oh gosh, India to Turkey to Brazil to China, um, everywhere. Uh, and they're, they're all going to be working on TensorFlow projects. Um, we have the Powered by TF Challenge, which I encourage all of you to enter into. Um, it's, uh, if you build something cool with TensorFlow 2.0 or you have a cool idea, um, you have the ability to win a ticket to TensorFlow World and then also have the chance to show your project to the TensorFlow engineering team, um, which is kind of magnificent. And then we've also released a completely free 14 segment course on Udacity, um, which is available uh, at the URL that you see there. And it takes you through TensorFlow JS, TensorFlow Lite, TensorFlow Serving, TensorFlow Hub, TF Keras, and more. Um, and it was created in collaboration with Sebastian Thrun. Um, so again, if you, if you want to, to get started, um, go for it. Excellent. So that feels like a good place to stop um, uh, for questions in particular. Um, but I also will share all of these slides, um, including the appendix, which has more examples of creating custom Keras layers um, using, uh, using TF 1.x and 2.0. And as you can see, the code looks very similar um, if you're using Keras, um, but, it, but the debugging bit gets quite a bit easier. So thank you so much. Um, you. And if you have any questions, please ask them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have, I have a question. Please feel free to use any of these mics if you have any questions. And Hello? enjoy your lunch. Yeah, uh, I attending. have a question. Yes. For the debugging function for TensorFlow 2.0, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to use um, a Python PDB package, sort of interactive debugger in uh, TensorFlow 2.0? Did, so did you see, say TFDB, TensorFlow data validation? Uh, no. What, what did you, sorry, I couldn't hear. Uh, yeah, my question was, can we use like an interactive debugger uh, like the Python PDB package in TensorFlow 2.0 or something like that? So any, any sort of Python functionality uh, that you use currently, um, you can use with TensorFlow 2.0.
Okay. Um, but uh, but if like I would I would be happy to to hunt down a, a better answer if if that doesn't if that doesn't answer your question. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But but it's the the point of it um, the point of 2.0 is that uh, the same sort of look and feel that you have when using PyTorch or Scikit-Learn or anything. Um, you should be able to to have with this. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yep. Hi, I actually have a very specific, uh, specific question. Um, I really appreciate your presentation. It's very uh, you know informative. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been playing with uh, you know the uh, estimator API, yeah. right? Like you know just like you know a regular example of like you know building the model and then saving it to this like a frozen graph, right? Mm -hmm. For some reason, like you know the only um, call function call that I can you know use to load the model back is in the contrib uh, you know namespace, if you will, right? right? And then, like, it actually doesn't work. Yeah. Like, as of a month ago, I was running a TensorFlow, I think, 13 or like 12 or 13 RC2 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, is there a reason why the low? I mean, like, it's a very specific question. So, I'm sorry for like, you know, being too specific. So, are you saying that you were using an estimator that was in tf.contrib. whatever it was, like tf.contrib. Uh, DNN class or whatever? I believe I was subclassing it or something. Then, like, I was actually like, you know. Basically, like you know, defining the layers myself, like mm -hmm. it's got like a certain etiquette, and like you know, there's a function to, you know, you have like three different yeah. switch cases, right? And then like you know, and then for some reason, you know, um, you know, I actually coded it so that you know, it saves the graph mm -hmm. um, to this, right? It, you know, and then like you know, I try to load it back, but like you know, for some reason, like I said, the, the function to load it is in the contrib, uh, you know, namespace, mm -hmm. right? Or yeah. whatever you know, Python terminology it is. So and, yeah. You know, it didn't work for me for whatever reason. So whenever you run the TF upgrade v2 utility, it looks for anything that it spies in the contrib, uh, the contrib namespace that's been migrated to 2.0, the core API. Um, and the estimator module, uh, or a number of the estimators in contrib, have been migrated to tf.estimator. Um, mm -hmm. So probably whatever you were using in that first bit is now under tf.estimator, that namespace, in the core API. Um, if you have any questions about that, uh, the, there's an RFC called um, tf.contrib sunset that outlines all, an RFC is, is kind of the design doc that talks about any changes to the core API. It's placed on GitHub under github.com slash tensorflow slash community. Okay. Um, and that design doc uh, sort of outlines every single module that you had within tf.contrib and then also what the fate for those endpoints is within the core API, um, or if it's migrated to a different package. So for example, distributions, um, most of them did not wind up in the core API, they wound up in TensorFlow probability. Um, but all of the changes, um, like if you care about contrib, that, I guess that's the TLDR. If you care about functionality that was in contrib, look at the RFC called tf.contrib sunset, and that tells you precisely what the equivalent, um, the equivalent point would be in the core API. And in general, I think that you know the GitHub page of the community section of it is uh, you know the place to ask questions. Um, you know instead of uh, Stack Overflow. <laughs> uh, well, so so I would, uh, to be perfectly honest, I would uh, suggest asking questions on the TensorFlow slash TensorFlow section um, because that's where the the team usually hangs out the most. Uh, TensorFlow and, slash TensorFlow. Yeah. That's on the GitHub. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so github.com slash tensorflow slash tensorflow. Okay. If you have a question, um, file an issue um, with the question, as long as it's not like, oh man, my input is, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm getting this error message that my input data is this, help me debug my model. Um, like that, that they probably won't answer and will direct you to Stack Overflow. But if, you're, if it's something to the effect of like, I'm really confused because I was using this contrib endpoint, now where is it in 2.0? That will be something that they okay. respond with. Just to you know, be honest, I did ask questions before on the GitHub page, and I didn't get a response. Yeah, there are a number. So, so I mentioned that there are 80 repos in the organization. Okay. The one that's monitored mm -hmm. is TensorFlow slash TensorFlow. Okay. All, all okay. of the rest of them, not so much. Okay. Really appreciate yeah. your help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the the embedding projector. That's I was trying to use embedding projector and use it in the notebooks, like you were showing. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't find I was able to use Tensive Board, but not embedding projector. 
Mm -hmm. Is there anything missing or is it something that I didn't notice? So I think support for the embedding projector within Colab notebooks is not, I don't think it's landed yet for 2.0. Okay. Um, but uh, the embedding projector for TensorBoard um, in 1.13 should be there um, if, you're, if you're using 1.13. For 2.0, there's, there's still some work to be done. Um, but all of the all of the the sort of features are being tracked. Um, so right now, for example, uh, TensorPoard support in 2.0 is still in the in progress column on the project tracker, um, and all of the issues and sort of features tied to that are are linked to that particular issue, that higher level issue. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, I have one more question. Mm -hmm. So the TensorFlow data set, yeah. uh, that part is pretty nice because it flows with you know what's to be done in the future, mm -hmm. but can I create my own version, like for my own data sets? Absolutely, so uh, it goes through how you can create a data set um, and either use it locally or to share it with the community, so like make your data famous sort of situation. Um, but if you want to create your own, um, so say you have um, a data set that you have housed on-prem, um, all you have to do is define, uh, it's like a 50 line sort of Python file um, that, and there's a template available for you to use, but basically all you have to do is go through and say like, this feature is continuous numeric, um, just like make sure that all of the data coming in is left float 32 or something. Um, and you do that for each feature in your structured data set. Or if it's an image, say like, it should be an image and it should be like 500 by 500 pixels or something. Um, so it's really just creating uh, it, and there, like I said, there are templates available for each of the specific use cases. On the TensorFlow web Yeah, uh, github.com slash tensorflow slash data sets. Okay, okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yep. Hi. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that you would be uh, sharing the slides. Where do we get them and when can we get them? Yep, it should be shared on the Spark AI website and I'll also be sharing a link with the PDF on my Twitter. Okay. And Twitter is dynamic web page, page spelled like my name. All right, cool. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, awesome talk. Um, question, are, are you guys recommending for distributed deep learning, or do you guys have any plans for like an all reduce, ring reduce kind of approach a la Horavad? So we are working um, in collaboration with Horavad, um, and Horavad's support for 2.0 is part of our, um, oh gosh, what's it called? I'm not good at the terminology. It's one of the things that we have to have before we say we have an official release. So Horavad support will um, Horavad support will be there. Awesome. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Okay, uh, I'm confused. Um, I recently started the Coursera sequence mm -hmm. on Google Cloud Platform, uh -huh. and that this seemed, and I started this about two weeks ago. I'm talking about Colab. Yep. Are they going different directions? Are they going to merge? What's going to happen? So that's a great question. Um, I guess you're, you're talking about kind of the notebook instances on Google Cloud Platform versus Google Colab itself as a platform? Well, or? there are all these, I'm just getting started with that, but there are all these tools over on GCP that yep. I'm going through training on, and here we have this. But Yeah, so the, so the nice thing about Colab um, is and uh, you can have a CMLE instance in Google um, on GCP, uh, so kind of a, a data science uh, workhorse of a machine, like a behemoth with lots and lots of GPU cap capabilities. And I mentioned before that there's a little drop down that says uh, local runtime. Um, so you can connect Colab up to that uh, cloud instance, that cloud VM that you're running on GCP. Um, if you also want to use the notebook instances within GCP, um, so to have access to all of the, you know, sort of the friendly permissioning that you might have within your work um, and all of the, you know, sort of the OAuth capabilities, um, all of that sort of enterprise specific, uh, you know, like data permissioning, data security stuff, um, you're probably better off with the notebook instances on cloud. Um, but if you do like the, the, collab, um, the collab experience, um, you're certainly free to use that with whatever backend you prefer. Um, so you can use it with your, uh, you can use it leveraging the compute on your laptop or on you know, a VM that you have running in Azure or GCP or AWS or anywhere. 
um, you would just be using the Colab interface um, in the browser. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you. So I want to ask about distributed TensorFlow and what are the plans for kind of production distribution of that. So, you know, I'm one of these, in one of these use cases, I'm in a medical imaging device company. So a lot of our image processing code is on Windows. So now we use that Windows code through PyBind with TensorFlow. And this is not something that's possible to rewrite or migrate or even put it in a Docker because Docker does not support GPU optimization on Windows. So today we use this module called HT Condor, which is basically a task distribution, a queue distribution framework to distribute TensorFlow jobs. And it's a disaster. And I would really stop, like to stop supporting that. And uh, so what are the plans, you know, and it seems like, right, distributed TensorFlow is the, the, what could actually help us a lot. Mm -hmm. Because like we don't need Spark, you know, we're in a different world. Like we work on these huge imaging data sets. Yep. And so what, what do you think about that and what is going to be the direction there and is this something we're going to be able to use? Gotcha. And I know that, um, so Windows support is always a struggle uh, with TensorFlow, I, I, just because I, I think most of the engineers, um, most of the engineers that we have uh, working on it at Google, and and the engineers that are um, the engineers that are contributing from the open source community usually use Linux environments. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, but if you if you send me um, the package that you're that you're the name of the package that you're currently struggling with, the mm -hmm. um, like I, I will send you I will forward it to the guy who's responsible for Windows support on my team. I'm webpage at google.com. Okay. Um, page spelled like my name. Um, but it's, if, you, if you have um, sort of specific uh, sort of technical questions about Windows environments um, no, distributed. I mean, it, yeah, it's more about the distribution, right? So yeah. I already have the Windows environment problem solved. Now what I need is I need distribution of tasks across yeah. on-prem and cloud, right? This is right. ideally what I would want. Yeah, and and like I said, the I, I know for I know for a fact that right now distributed um, distributed GPU training for Windows specifically has not landed, mm -hmm. um, and and it's not uh, like the the Windows support is always kind of late to land, just because nobody nobody working on it has uh, nobody working on the platform either internally or externally. Um, like everybody prioritizes Linux, yeah, so right. um, so I, I will try to hunt down who could help with with that. Um, but it's web page at Google. What? Oh yeah. So if you're if you're interested in doing distributed training um, with Kubernetes, I strongly suggest taking a look at Kubeflow. Yeah. Um, well, and my problem there is that I cannot, like, we have a very significant image processing library that co-registers, you know, CT to atlases and all these kind of things. And it uses GPU, and it's a Windows thing. And so I cannot rewrite it because it's, you know, 300 men. I mean, it's something stupid. I mean, it's like 30 years of work. And it's not, uh, you know, several hundred people, right? So it's not, it's a big deal. And I cannot put it in a Docker because of lack of GPU support. So now we have it working with TensorFlow and PyBind. And it's fine, right? But it's getting that scaled across GPUs. That's the problem. And and like like I said, please send me the specifics, like the technical specifics, mm -hmm. and and I'll. But I don't have familiarity with PyBind. Um, but but regardless, uh, distributed computation across GPUs should be something um, that uh, that TensorFlow 2.0 supports in a in a straightforward way. It's just we don't do it for Windows yet. Yeah. Thank you. A great talk, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, you. I have a question, but it's not too technical. Uh, it's more on the on the um, side of uh, team and uh, creation. So I would like to get your insights in terms of um, in order to get some some project could be a small project started and showing some results uh, to the business and the stakeholders. What would be your advice in terms of uh, building creation? What kind of uh, skills, what kind of people should I have in a team, and how big that team should be? Gotcha. So um, the, the question of building a data science team is, is always a hard one. And, uh, and I, would, I would argue that it, it matters as to what sort of level of maturity your company is at in, in terms of the data that you have available. Right? Like, so, so I always strongly suggest, like, first build out a data platform. 
Um, and then first, like, take a look at the data that you've got. So start doing dashboarding, start sort of understanding um, you know, what, what you've seen historically and start building a set of questions that you want to ask. Um, and then you can, you can start trying to do predictive modeling. And I usually suggest doing it with traditional machine learning first um, and then deep learning. Um, because the, the reality is that most businesses, most business problems can be solved with traditional machine learning. I mean, most businesses, most business problems aren't like Google scale data, you know, like they're, they're not, um, like you can get pretty interesting insights with like 10,000 records. So, and it, it doesn't make sense to, um, to sort of aggressively drive a uh, business towards starting with deep learning immediately if there's something that they can accomplish with traditional methods. Um, and it's also a lot easier to find, um, it's, it's a lot easier to sort of build a team, uh, you know, from traditional methods you know, to everybody kind of learning together to start practicing deep learning um, than otherwise. But I would, I would suggest build out your data platform first, understand the kind of data that you have, get it all kind of centralized and everybody familiar with working on it. Um, then start building a set of interesting questions that would really, really help your business. Price those out um, and prioritize them. Um, so, so, you know, you'll probably come up with a list of at least 100. Um, figure out which ones would be um, sort of the, the low-hanging fruit. Um, buy, get, uh, get stakeholder buy-in and then start, start attacking. But I, I am a firm believer, like I said, that traditional methods are, can be very, very valuable. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. Thank you.